I'm on. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another exciting edition of the Suplex City Wrestling Podcast. My name is JJ Prudem, and alongside me here in the broadcast booth, virtually, is the one and only Scott Falder. How's it going, Scott? JJ, I have a dog barking in the background. Don't you love it when we work at home? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, we could actually see on camera now. Of course, this is just an audio podcast oh. as of right now. You can see it. A nice little, oh my gosh, Scott, it's taking a crap on your chair. It looks Look like that. he is. It does. It, yeah, it's kind of bowed up. All right. Also here in the virtual studio is uh, a longtime friend of mine. I like to call him Money. That's Charles Marquez. How's it going, Chuck? It's going great. Good to be with you guys today. Well, it's good to have you here. We got a lot to talk about, lots to cover. Obviously, the wrestling world is on fire right now as a lot of crazy stuff happened over the last couple of days. Uh, first off, we all know that Vince McMahon uh, was on his way back into the board, and eventually they had to let him in. Vince McMahon returns to the board of directors, is now the executive chairman of the board, along with George Berrios and Michelle Wilson, uh, former co presidents of WWE that were let go and terminated in order to make room for Nick Khan to come in to prep the company for a potential sale in the future. Man, so much has happened over the last couple of days. So a few days ago, the daughter of Vince McMahon, Stephanie McMahon, had returned as the co-CEO alongside Nick Khan after Vince resigned and retired, apparently, back in July uh, amidst the whole sex scandal. And she, I think she was doing a good job working alongside Nick, but with Vince coming back and with this hostile takeover, it turns out that within a couple of days, Stephanie announces that she's going to resume her leave of absence that she had uh, begun before the sex scandal took place, before she took over as co-CEO and uh, she resigned from WWE. Guys, my mind is blown. This sends a bunch of warning flags. And of course, we've got more to talk about shortly that uh, this has kind of grown. It was like this all happened in one day and the very next day, even more craziness kind of blew up the, the entire wrestling world. So what are your guys' initial thoughts after Vince returns and Stephanie McMahon immediately resigns from her position? Uh, Charles, let's go ahead and take it with you first. Um, I know that you thought she was doing a fair job thus far and has been a great ambassador to WWE. What do you think is the message here that Stephanie almost immediately resigns her position from the co-CEO position in WWE? Well, first I, uh, I had seen it online like, uh, everybody else. And it was just, it was very abrupt, you know, Tuesday evening at in the evening time, just sort of out of the blue. But as we would find out, what, 24 hours or so later, that there was definitely more to that story than her just saying, hey, I'm going to resign uh, as chairwoman or co-CEO co of the company. Uh, obviously, there's more to it, which obviously we'll get into in a second. But on its face, her departure was very shocking. Again, now 24 hours later, not so much. Yeah, so we talked about it a few days ago, or I should say a week ago on our last podcast. We uh, we actually spoke at length about how Vince was attempting to return, uh, trying to take over the company as far as the board, along with Wilson and Berrios. And as of now, as of the recording of today, they have returned, and he's the executive chairman of the board. And Stephanie, in her position in WWE, was co-CEO alongside Nick Khan, as well as the chairwoman of the board of directors. So with them coming in and taking back over in these board of director seats, immediately three people were ousted from the board and then two resigned. So with her resigning from her position, it almost tells me like she may have been one of the ones that voted against her dad returning. I'm not really sure... I don't know. I'm not there. I'm not a fly on the wall, but it, it does make you curious. Like, was she against her dad returning? Of course, everything she's saying verbally has been very pro Vince McMahon. And of course that could be, Hey, I want to get an inheritance out of this old man. So of course I'm going to speak glowingly of him, but she says like, Hey, this is a great move. 
Everybody is very happy with him returning to the board of directors. Uh, Scott, do you have the same feeling? I know that you were the one who on last week's episode was very vehement about how this is a hostile takeover, even though it's not somebody outside of the company. He had had you know, stock in the company and, and the majority stock. So this is really just him taking over the board to position them for the rights fees that are upcoming, as well as a potential sale. Right now, I'm going to call Vince Daddy Dearest. And you can always uh, refer back to a movie, Mommy Dearest. But we'll call Vince Daddy Dearest right now because what he has done is told Stephanie, you know what? You may have done a fine job these last eight months of uh, pretending to run the ship while Nick Khan did it. But why don't you step aside and let Daddy show you how it's really done by selling the company? So Stephanie McMahon comes out just uh, within 48 hours of Daddy Dearest coming back to the company, and she puts together, well, I shouldn't say she does, the attorneys put together the perfect written resignation letter. This thing is perfect. There's not a, a single thought out of place. It is designed for her to leave quietly and not upset anyone. But one of my favorite parts is she writes, WWE is in such a strong position that I have decided to return to my leave and take it one step further with my official resignation. What a sentence. Not only am I returning to my leave, but hey, F you, I quit. What? What the heck is going on here? But with all the rumors floating around of potential sale to certain parties, there could be another reason why she quit. And unfortunately, it's not a good reason. We'll get into that later. But for right now, uh, Daddy Dearest is back. Daughter Dearest is gone. Husband Dearest is still there for now. We'll see what happens. JJ, I'm, I'm. I'm running out of words for them. <laughs> so I think that it's an interesting, an interesting take that one thing that Charles, you said previously last week when we were having this conversation, um, and I thought it was really apropos to, to what's going on. We never envisioned Vince ever trying to sell the company. And it, it's very obvious now that with Nick Khan being brought into the company, it was very much, that's the guy who does this. He goes and takes companies and then prepares them for big sales, okay? Uh, you had said some stuff to the effect of, if it were Shane in this position, I don't see him not helping and to facilitate Shane taking over as the heir of WWE. I think it's it's a male thing versus a female thing. I think because it's his daughter that he's not he's not really trying to hand over the torch to pass the torch to the next generation. So I thought that that was kind of an interesting take. Do you still feel that that's in line with that that statement you made last week? I do. I stand by those comments that I made last week. I think if it was Shane that had never left and who was actively involved in the business, I think that we wouldn't even be having this conversation. Shane would have been the fourth generation male in the of the McMahon family that would have been running that company. And then I'm sure there would have been another person in the next generation after that. Yeah, I absolutely do think that 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 would have been the case. If Shane would have still been around, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. Yeah, I, I'm going to be very interested to see how all of this plays out. And of course, that kind of ties right in to the next big thing that we need to talk about. It's it's kind of the elephant in the room, as it were, or the camel, if that's the choice that you prefer to talk about. Um, there is a, a major shakeup going on in the world of pro wrestling. This, this stuff was big, right? I mean, we were all talking about, wow, this is going to be the main article we'll be covering this week because we felt like, hey, he's back in on the board, he being Vince McMahon. And then with Stephanie resigning, it, it says to us just from the outside, like, hey, there's something going on there that she's not wanting to be a part of it or she's of no use to them now as a figurehead. So um, 
Nick Khan was brought in according to Conrad Thompson. Conrad Thompson, of course, is uh, the big pod father that does a lot of podcasts alongside Bruce Pritchard, Rick Flair, uh, Jeff Jarrett, and the like. And he recently said that Nick Khan is friends of a guy that Conrad knows that goes into companies like WWE and helps facilitate them being structured a little differently, leaning up, making some money, and then being able to sell. And it's being reported by Conrad in a conversation that he had that Nick Khan stands to gain more money from the sale of WWE than AEW's entire year of rights fees. And to me, that just blows me away that the company, AEW, a second place, albeit a far away second place company, an entire year of rights fees, which I think... I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I believe it's somewhere around $50 million a year. So it looks like Nick Khan stands to make a very substantial amount of money in the sale of WWE, no matter who it's to. And that kind of leads us into who it's being reported that might be buying WWE. Of course, if you're on TikTok, if you're on any other sites right now, you know who that that country is that is a apparently in the running to buy WWE. Some of the, the names that jumped out as potential suitors, Comcast, of course, the ones that own uh, Universal, NBC, um, Fox was a potential suitor, and the big one was Disney. Uh, a lot of people didn't want to see that happen because it would be very commercialized. But can you imagine Undertaker uh, clones rocking around in Disney and signing autographs and taking photos with kids or whatever? Great. Wonderful. Um, it's being reported by someone online. And of course this is rumor. So there's no substantiated, uh, gravitas to this, but it's being reported that Saudi Arabia, an investment firm in Saudi Arabia is purchasing WWE and that it's going to be for a very large amount of money. Now, the first thing out of my mind is, oh my gosh, I do not want to see WrestleMania take place in Riyadh. Saudi Arabia, you know, I just, I can't, I can't imagine with the crowd being what it is there, them getting their fingers into it. I've always wanted it to be owned by a McMahon. That's my own personal choice. Um, I know I've got a lot of feelings. I'll share those uh, shortly, but I know that both of these gentlemen that we do the podcast with are extremely passionate about WWE, about professional wrestling in general but what's taking place with the potential for this sale. If this takes place where Saudi Arabia and this investment firm buys WWE, um, yeah, a lot of people are going to make a lot of money, Vince McMahon included. But I think that it's going to turn away a lot of fans in drove. Scott, what do you think? Oh, you don't even want to get me started on this. Okay, all you listeners, put your feet up, grab the... Grab the snack mix, grab a beer, and get ready because you have just turned me on on the on switch. If, I was like, Scott, I'm so happy I could turn you on. Thanks, if, buddy. If, 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 if the rumors do pan out to be true, which it is entirely possible, the Saudi Arabian Public Investment Fund group want wrestling. They would love to buy WWE. And the reason they would love to buy WWE is to whitewash their public image. They have what's called the PIF, Public Investment Fund, all started because of their king having a, a vision for to reach certain goals by 2030, which I'll let Charles get into. But one of them is to get out of de depending on oil for their money and using tourism and expats moving into the Saudi Arabia region. But they have seed money of $600 billion. That is a tremendous amount of money. It's more than Charles has from what JJ has told me. And by a little bit. I mean, not, not like a large amount, but by a, a substantial bit. amount. 
Right, right. But but if if they were to pay five billion dollars for WWE, imagine you have six hundred dollars and you pay five bucks for lunch. Is that going to break you? Absolutely not. So what they do, what the whole purpose of this is, they love buying sports teams. The the PIF invested very, very, very heavily in F1, Formula One, the number one motorsports in the world. And now one of the Saudi Arabians is the president of F1. That's how much money they bought in with. Liberty Media still owns it. Uh, Saudi is the president. They also purchased the Newcastle, uh, the Newcastle, England's Newcastle United Soccer Club back in October of 21. They bought it from a billionaire who had owned it for 14 years. Once again, that is so everyone says really nice things about Saudi Arabia. Yes, we're a great country. Yes, we're nice people. Absolutely not. We do not hold people down. We do not discriminate against women. We do not discriminate against the LGBTQ community. Okay, if you say so. Then, not only that, they created the Live Golf Tournament, the Live Golf League, which is taking away from the PGA. They are paying outrageous sums to these golfers just to golf for them and say nice things about Saudi Arabia. It's a big PR campaign, but they have $600 billion for public relations. So I, I'm going to keep going, but right now I'm going to take a breath, take a drink, and I'm going to throw it back to you, JJ. All right. So I, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff that you brought up right now. It is it is a substantial amount of money. Anybody hears the numbers that are being thrown around? Uh, obviously, the valuation they're going through right now, they being WWE, is going through right now and trying to figure out what the valuation is. Some have reported $5 billion, Some have said $6 billion. But let's say Saudi Arabia decides to step in and I'll use a number that Charles and I spoke with earlier, and Charles brought up, and I thought that's kind of an interesting take. So Charles will be stealing an idea from you, if that's okay. Charles said, mm -hmm. what if they come in with $8 billion, which is above value, which is a move that Saudi has actually done several points. In F1, they did it as well as with the soccer league. Um, to come in way over the value, and Vince walks away with a, a huge chunk of money. I can really see something like that happening. Now, Charles, if you want to elaborate on that, on your thoughts about this entire endeavor, is it, I know there's a lot of public outcry right now. Uh, a lot of people are saying, how dare Vince McMahon, you know, Vince McMahon will rue the day that he's working with terrorists. And we don't want to get political in any way on this show, but obviously there's something to be said for fair market value and making money on a product. Vince is 76 years old. He spent the last 50 years building this company into what it was. Charles, what do you think the right move is? If you're Vince McMahon, do you take that Saudi money and run? Wow, what an intro. And I don't know how in the world that I could follow that wonderful geopolitical overview that Scott gave a minute ago. It's all true. It is all true. Let me start off by doing a continuation of what I did last week when I said, Vince is a genius, and I'll tell you why. As of this morning, the market, uh, the stock market had WWE valued at about $6.7 billion. They were up uh, at around 92 yesterday. They were down a bit today, which is uh, right at their 52-week high. Uh, the market has spoken in terms of what they're hearing. They like uh, the fact that there's going to be the maximization of shareholder value, which is what we've seen in every single statement that has come out. Here's why I say Vince is so brilliant on this. <clears throat> as you, as we've been talking about the uh, the rights, the the media rights, and all those things 
are coming up in 2024. He knows that Comcast, he knows that Disney, he knows that Fox, he knows that even Apple, all those different companies are dying for live content. And what Vince McMahon has is a brand that's known all over the world that has great income, that has, you know, just this incredible well of uh, revenue coming in, uh, has this projected growth and so forth. And so as Vince prepares to figure out what he's going to do on that end of it, he, of course, went out and found somebody that he already has uh, a partnership with, uh, Saudi Arabia. They do Crown Jewel. They, they have a 10-year deal to do Crown Jewel. So I think Vince knows the politics of it as well. Uh, he, uh, he understands everything that Scott pointed out, uh, uh, a country that has not had the greatest PR in the world. Obviously, there were some, you know, recent events uh, that happened with a, a certain journalist that was killed. Uh, we won't go into all those details. But, you know, and the other things that you had stated, JJ, as far as the, you know, the 9-11 thing, uh, you know, and that entire thing with, you know, whether things were funded or not funded and so forth and so on. So they know. I, let's let's not be naive about it. They know that they have a bit of a PR problem, which, as Scott pointed out, they got into the Formula One stuff. They got into golf. They got into a bunch of other things. And ultimately, the the driving force behind all of this is Mohammed bin Salman, who's the crown prince. And as Scott said, he's looking to diversify the Saudi Arabian economy, which is why they have something called a 2030 plan. It's a 2030 vision for Saudi Arabia. Everybody listening, look it up. It's out there. Uh, so Vince is basically going to these guys and saying, hey, here's my bottom line price. This is good PR for you guys. This gives you guys something that, you know, it's a drop in the bucket. If you wrote a blank check or if you, you wrote us a check for Eight, eight billion, seven billion, something above market value. It's, it's, it's a drop in the bucket to them. It means that's, that's not, you know, really much money for them. So they could write the check and not even bat an eye. But it's, again, good PR for them. It's, it's the ability to put out their product. Uh, it's their ability to use it as propaganda. No different than China. Uh, the reason China invested in Hollywood and invested in the NBA so that they could put their propaganda out. You know, everybody does it. You know, we may not like it, but that's the reality of the world that we live in. Saudi Arabia is doing nothing differently than China's doing. Do we like it? No. Is it, you know, is it something that we're, you know, overjoyed or thrilled about? No, because it's, you know, cutting into what we're trying to do here in the United States. But, but so be it. And, and I think Vince is now telling those companies that are interested in his product, saying, hey, look, I've got a buyer. Here's my price. And if you want this company or if you want to continue with these rights, then here's what you're going to have to pay because I have somebody who will write me a check right now for this price. So this is the value. And I think that's why I go back to saying Vince is brilliant. Because he also understands that having his daughter, this is a McMahon company. He founded it, for, or he bought it from his father 40 years ago. It's been around since, what, 1953. This is a McMahon company. Stephanie McMahon, they would not do business with her, period. The Saudis are not going to deal with a female. That's just life. That's how they view it, and they're not going to deal with her. Vince knows that. And Vince knows that the only way that they're going to do business is with him. That's why I was saying the Shane thing was so important, because they would do business with him. That's just you know, whether people like it or they don't like it, the Saudis would have never done business with Stephanie. And so I think Vince has basically gotten the WWE to where that guy is going to completely be able to maximize the profit for that company, whether they keep it, whether they sell it. Either way, somebody's going to pay a premium for that. And that's the bottom line, as Stone Cold would say.
<laughs> absolutely. Oh, hell yeah. So um, I want to just piggyback off of that. Yeah, absolutely. The the entire deal is, is one thing that it comes down to that people are really hammering on is they they want to get into the idea of this is a terrorist country and how can we do business with them? And I don't want to defend them as being the owners. Personally, I don't I don't want to see Saudi Arabia purchase WWE. I would like for it to always be in the hands of a McMahon. I, I, it's just who I am. I want to see it continue on in the bloodline and hope that they will respect the tradition and the art and keep it going for years and years. And I'm not sure selling it to an investment firm from another country that they're going to respect it or view it the same way that we do or that the McMahons can. Having said all that, a lot of people jump on the misogyny thing about how, you know, they, they don't care for women and, and all the like, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't allow women performers to wrestle on the original, uh, crown jewel events. And, um, I think that it, it has to be said that there finally came a time that they did soften and change their stance. A lot of stuff has been taking place in their ability to try to diversify their country and more westernize how they're doing things. They are starting to allow women to drive. Uh, they did finally start allowing WWE performers that are women to wrestle in front of the live crowds. Albeit they were wrestling in t-shirts and long tights under that so that you couldn't see any uh, aspects of their bodies. I think at this last Crown Jewel event that they had, um, the women had had outfits created that were full body suits. So uh, I think that there's something to be said that they are softening their position on some of that stuff. And it is in an effort to try to westernize their culture and to try to diversify uh, finances and, and profits in the future for their country. Um, I think a lot of people have been talking about what's this going to mean for the future of women's wrestling. A lot of people on TikTok and on YouTube have been stating, well, there goes women's wrestling. I, I don't think that that's going to be the case. I really don't. It, it is a dark day if they take over WWE just because there wouldn't be a McMahon in charge any longer. But I don't believe that they're going to kill women's wrestling. But I am curious about a couple of other things. There are some big stars that have stated they're never going to perform in Saudi Arabia. They don't go to Crown Jewels and all these different events, which is unusual because those events actually pay better than some WrestleManias. So with that being said, one of them that just jumps out at me right now is the most white hot performer in the company right now, and that's Sami Zayn. Sami Zayn is a Syrian by birth, and he is, although he is Muslim, he he does not attend any of these events, and he wouldn't, he couldn't. That's just, it's one of those things. Are they going to want to employ somebody who is so vocally anti everything Saudi Arabia? So I'd love to I'd love to get your guys' response on that. Where do you see somebody like Sami Zayn, who is right now at this moment, he's like this generation stone cold, like out of nowhere, like an overnight success because they made him that way. Or let's instead of comparing him to Stone Cold, nobody's Stone Cold. He's kind of like this generation's or this this season in our lives. He's like he's like Daniel Bryan was a few years ago, where the crowd has made him an ultra mega star. What happens with them? Is he going to get shot in the foot throughout this whole Saudi Arabia thing if they take over? Uh, Scott, why don't I why don't I hear from you first? Sami Zayn, other stars, other wrestlers, they're going to lose a lot. There are people like Sami Zayn that have already publicly called out Saudi Arabia for some of their human rights violations against Syria, and he's not the only one. Uh, the, a lot of the women wrestlers have stated they won't wrestle in Saudi Arabia, even though there's a big payday because of the human rights violations. I, I, I just cannot see the, the staff of WWE, the wrestlers of WWE being the exact same now as it would be tomorrow. If Saudi Arabia were to buy WWE. There, there will be some changes. And it's a gift for AEW. That will allow them to sign some great talent. 
So I, I, you know, I'm sorry. But now here's the other thing, though. You, you still have to look at, let's say, for instance, PIF, the Saudi Arabian Public Investment Fund, PIF buys the WWE and they overpay for it just because they can. It's like, we want it. We don't care what it costs. We're taking it. Then they have to worry about negotiating, number one, TV contracts. When they started Live Golf, LIV Golf, they did not have a TV deal. No one would touch it. Fox, ABC, NBC, CBS, ESPN, no one would touch it because it was tied to Saudi Arabia. You look at the terrorism, you look at the, the human rights, you know, the whole thing. No one would touch it. So what they ended up doing is they paid. They just recently signed a deal in September to air Live Golf on Fox. But instead of Fox paying them, they're paying Fox. They're buying the time on Fox to air the golf tournament because that, that's how hands-off the United States media is. In fact, Live Golf not only is responsible for paying for the time, they are responsible for the cost of production, and they are required to sell any advertising to be sold. So Fox is hands-off. We're just going to take your money. So you're looking at the same thing with wrestling. The next thing is WWE owns the wrestling library of not only WWE. They own the wrestling library of WCW. They own the wrestling library of ECW. They own the wrestling library of many, many of the independents going all the way back. What's going to happen to that library? That library is to people like us, to people listening, to the anyone who loves wrestling like we do, that library is worth its weight in gold just in viewing the, the goosebumps you get when you see it and when you hear the people talking. Does the Saudi Arabia PIF really care about the library? Are they going to allow people to access the library? Are they going to use the library? And then once they reach their goal of indoctrinating the West into accepting them and liking them, even with their issues, where's that, what's that library going to do? No one will ever be able to buy it because they don't need the money. There's just so, so many things. And I'm sorry, I keep going off on a tangent. I will go out on a limb here in case you haven't figured it out. I do not want Saudi Arabia to buy the WWE. Plain and simple. Ah, ah. Well, if, if Saudi Arabia doesn't, that does leave an opportunity for Charles Marquez to pick it up. So let's go ahead and, and throw it over to you, Charles. Do you see guys like Sami Zayn having a future in WWE if the McMahons hand over to Saudi Arabia, the investment firm? Well, I think like anything else, there's always going to be collateral damage. So there's going to be those people that just based on principle, uh, they're going to say, yeah, I'm, I'm never going to wrestle for this outfit because of my deeply held beliefs of X, Y, and Z. So uh, there may be that. I mean, he may be, uh, gone. Uh, there may be others. I'm sure there would be others, but let's not forget about the power of money. And, uh, as you guys know, Ronaldo, the great soccer player just signed a $200 million deal with the Saudis to play soccer there. Uh, the golfers, uh, some of the best golfers in the world, you know, looked at the check and they said, uh, I'm signing up for this. And so I think that it's one of those things where uh, at the end of the day, as they say, money talks. And as you know, as when they start writing those checks, uh, I find it very hard to believe that some of these individuals who, you know, we, we hear the horror stories of these uh, individuals 
who end up getting older, who are wrestlers and they have health problems down the road and, you know, they have to set up GoFundMes and so forth and all of this. And, uh, you know, you start talking to some of these younger guys and you start putting a couple million dollars in front of them and this and that, uh, you, you'll be surprised how many of them uh, make the jump. So I think they're going to have plenty of opportunities to have talent. Now, as far as what happens with the library, who knows? I mean, maybe Mohammed bin Salman will be watching the entire NWO angle because it was so damn good. <laughs> and, you know, the the population at large may be walking around with NWO shirts for all we know. You know, maybe this is a way to 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 accelerate the westernization of uh of Saudi Arabia as people with uh Stone Cold shirts and NWO shirts and everything else. I think that um you know, it, it, it's 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 a lot of news that has happened very quickly in the last 48 hours. And whether or not they buy it, it's obviously going to be a seismic shift in the world of wrestling that we love. I will make a prediction. If it comes to pass that WWE is purchased, then I just think that that leaves room in the market for another billionaire, the likes of Tony Khan and his family to enter the marketplace, whether it's consolidating and purchasing impact and NWA or MLW and, and creating another company like AEW. I definitely think that if this comes to pass, I, I think that there will be another person, another company, another person, another billionaire that will enter the market. And I think we'll have more competition is what I guess. I think that with WWE, if they become owned by Saudi Arabia, obviously we know what the intent is and it, it'll be a propaganda piece, but it'll be probably good wrestling. But I think there will be another uh, entity that enters the market. So we'll see what well, happens. Char I'm Charles, looking forward I, to it. I kind of want to jump in here because you are talking about another billionaire that could potentially do this. And as we record this tonight, the Mega Millions drawing has not been held on Friday night yet. We're just right mm -hmm. ahead of that because we're recording early. I want everyone to know that I did go buy my, my tickets. So that if I do win, I shouldn't say if, when I do win, not only will I be moving to Aspen, Colorado and buying that big house on the hill, I could potentially start my own wrestling company with the $1.35 billion that I'm going to take. Now, everyone says, you know, you're only going to get about $800 million of that because of taxes. You have to remember, I'll avoid the taxes. I'll just not pay them and say <laughs> the checks smart. in the mail. That makes you smart. Yeah. So anyway, I could be that potential billionaire to start that company. And I love wrestling enough that I I, I would seriously <laughs> consider it. But I'm sorry to interrupt, but JJ, you, you. Well, Scott, <clears throat> if you do happen to win that money and you do need a couple of lackeys, I know Charles and myself would love to come work for you. So uh, with that being said, we've got a lot to unpack. Over the last few days, it kind of has been a whirlwind. We'll continue to monitor the situation as things arise. Uh, remember, it's not a done deal yet, so it's just rumors as of right now, but it is a lot to kind of digest. Over the course of the next few days, weeks, months, uh, there could potentially be a new owner of WWE. Could they potentially be going back to private? We'll, we'll wait to see how it all kind of unfolds, but isn't it fun? Isn't it fun that all this stuff is happening and that we have the opportunity to come onto this podcast and to talk about it with you, the listening audience. And you guys have really been, really been turning in or tuning in uh, as of late. We recently started our YouTube channel and you can always go over and please like and subscribe. If you could subscribe uh, to our channel, it would greatly help. And if you have friends that uh, you can get onto their account, you know, hack into their stuff. If you could subscribe on their stuff too, that'd be wonderful. You could find that at youtube.com forward slash at 
Suplex City Pod. Uh, you could also follow me over on Twitter uh, at JJ Purdom, and I, I I do a couple of little of the tweets here and there. And you can uh, do our personal Twitter at Suplex City Pod, and that's where you can go to send in questions that we can answer right here on the air. Uh, Scott, where can they reach you when they want to reach out to the social media sites? You can find me on Twitter at Scott underscore Falder. And Charles, what about you, my friend? Yeah, they could find me at Charles C. Marquez. They could find us on, they could find me on Twitter and on Instagram. Very and cool. I would just and ask for our listeners out there, when you go to our websites, whether it's Scott's, whether it's mine, whether it's JJ's, don't forget to tweet, retweet. Don't forget to quote tweet. And definitely don't forget to hashtag Suplex City Wrestling Podcast wrestling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And look for all of those links that we will be putting on our web, on, on the YouTube channel. Oh, and, and just right, so you, you guys. know, when, 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 uh, within the next few weeks, our YouTube channel is going to get exponentially better because right now it is our company logo with the business name on it. But you're going to see our smiling faces very soon. We are going to be on YouTube in all of our makeup free glory. And in fact, I have a, you guys don't know this, but I have a plastic surgery coming up here in the next few days that they're going to make me look like George Clooney. Oh, oh wow. dude, I love it. Well, we yeah. look forward to seeing that. Yeah. So, uh, and also uh, really soon, if this really does take off, we're going to go ahead and open up uh, Scott's OnlyFans. So look for that. <laughs> look for that. Because, hey, whatever revenue streams that we've got to do to, to make some money so we can keep bringing podcasts to you. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you to the Super Gamer Boys and Garrett Morlang for producing this show each and every week. We hope that you continue to come here and listen to more of the, the podcast and to tell your friends about it. We appreciate each and every one of you. And we look forward to seeing you next time right here in the center of the ring. So long, everybody. <laughs>